Former Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan has offered to hold talks with the government to resolve a political crisis that has engulfed the country for more than a year. This is what Khan said earlier in the week. I will form a committee. I say two things. If the government convinces the committee that Pakistan will get better without Imran Khan and they have a solution, I will step aside for the sake of the country. I can back off. If the government can convince the committee the country will run better without me, I am ready to quit. A serious climb down for a leader who had been demanding early elections since he lost a vote of no confidence in parliament last summer. Since then, he'd held massive rallies across the country, directly challenging Pakistan's ruling elite. So what changed? For starters, the crackdown by the establishment against his Pakistan Tehreek-e Insaf party following widespread riots on the 9th of May. You'll remember these scenes that followed Khan's arrest on that day over one of the more than 100 cases against him. People attacked army installations and the house of a senior army officer. The government's response has been swift. Most senior leaders in Khan's PTI have since been arrested and re-arrested over the violence. In the end, more than two dozen members have either quit the party or politics altogether. People like 72-year-old Shirin Mazari, arrested five times in two weeks. This is what she told the press as she resigned. She said, and I quote, My health deteriorated during the 12 days of arrest, release, abduction and release. I am leaving active politics. Her former boss, Imran Khan, is very clear who's behind all this. It's not the security agency. It's one man, the army chief. There's no democracy in that uh, in the army. The army is getting maligned by what is happening right now. And sadly, the events that happened when I was inside, I only found out afterwards. Because army is getting maligned because of one man. And one man is scared. So is the military really behind all this? Let's ask journalist Mathiullah Jan joining me now from Islamabad. Mathiullah, Imran Khan blames Army Chief Asim Munir for the crackdown on him and his party. Is he right? Is the military behind all this? Well, uh, Imran Khan doesn't have to blame it on army. Actually, when the army installations are attacked and military is under attack, not only physically, but also virtually through social media. So they have to defend, and they are trained, trained and groomed for defending themselves. And especially we are talking about the military installations, military areas, so they cannot just sit back. So it's not an, uh, a matter of uh, Imran Khan blaming army or not. It's a matter of army reacting and responding to the allegations and actions of Pakistan Tariq and Saf and Imran Khan in this particular case. But why the personal name calling? What does Imran Khan have against Asim Munir? Well, um, it's very natural. I don't really think that it's a big matter uh, because Army Chief is head of the military establishment. So, and Army Chief had traditionally been playing an active role in Pakistan's policies, economic, foreign, or political. So Imran Khan naming army chief uh, is not new. Even before him, we heard former prime minister, the ousted prime minister, Nawaz Sharif, blaming the predecessor of the present, present army chief. So because of a particular history that Pakistan has for the last 75 years, the three declared martial laws and many others undeclared. So I don't find anything uh, really new or surprising when a politician names an army chief for whatever is happening in countries like Pakistan. What would you call the, the current crackdown that the, the PTI, the Pakistan Tariq and Saf, Imran Khan's party is facing? Uh, senior members have been arrested, re-arrested essentially till the time that they quit the party or quit uh, politics altogether. Is that something that is new in Pakistan or is that just something that's new for the PTI? Well, the only thing new uh, this time is that a political party and its uh, leaders actually led crowds and mobs to attack military installations and the cantonment areas in the country. So this is something really new. 
And uh, whatever is happening now is you may call it crackdown, but basically it's a reaction, it's a response, it's a defense mechanism that comes into operation automatically when a military institution is attacked. So I think uh, if we look at it in this way, this is uh, certainly new, and uh, you may call it crackdown, but it may be a response of the state machinery uh, to a criminal act, and this is what is happening right now. As far as the political engineering you are hinting to is concerned, I think uh, it is uh, now part of Pakistan's political history and constitutional history. It has been happening, and it is happening again. But this time, as the response and reaction and retaliation of the state institutions uh, was very hard, so it was but natural for many politicians to succumb to the pressures and tensions and tortures that uh, the, they were going through mentally. Uh, and therefore, I think many of them had to leave their party because they also had to protect their political career. So uh, we could see uh, that politically, Imran Khan and PTI has damaged itself a lot uh, in public perception and by attacking the military, which many people see as the ultimate savior of the country. Is that how the military is also being viewed currently, given that it is trying civilians associated with the May 9 violence in military courts, despite the UN and other NGOs criticizing the move? I mean, does uh, uh, the Pakistan military care about international criticism or even domestic criticism? Well, there will always be criticism for the military uh, to try civilians, and I have been among many of those rights activists and media persons who have been opposing such military trials and military court proceedings against the civilians, including journalists. Uh, but frankly speaking, uh, this law that we call as Pakistan Army Act is inherited from the Brit British colonial army, uh, which was created for this uh, colony of India. And this law continues to be on the statute books. And uh, this time, there are no new or separate military courts being established, like it was done a few years ago, and the Army Public School Peshawar was attacked, and 150 teachers and young students were butchered. So uh, that, those are the military courts established through a constitutional amendment. But this time, only some provisions of the existing Pakistan Army Act have been activated uh, to proceed as per the Army Act against some of the civilians, because they entered into the territorial jurisdiction of the military and the armed forces and actually attacked the military installation. So therefore, the civilians actually stepped into the Army Act rather than this being the other way around. We'll leave it there for the time being. Thanks so much for that context, Mathieu Lajan. The military, however, isn't alone in acting against Imran Khan. It has the government's support. This is what the defense minister had to say. Khwaja Asif said, and I quote, the government is considering banning the PTI for attacking the very foundations of the state. For more, I'm joined by my colleague, DW reporter, Binish Javed. Binish, welcome. The government seems to be talking the military's language. Why is that? Binish, because they have to look out for themselves. Uh, the politicians and the government, they know where the ultimate power lies. And the ultimate power lies with the military in Pakistan. So if you're a politician and if you want to remain in power, or if you want to come in power, you know it's not so easy without the support of the military. And also, if you want to eliminate your political opponents, um, there is a thinking that it might be easy if you're supporting the military. So I think um, the government, it is basically a fight for survival. And even Imran Khan, um, who is now having this tussle with the military, he came into power, his rivals say, with the backing of the government. So I think there is an understanding that if you want to continue have the backing of the military, you have to support uh, and their decisions and even undemocratic decisions, such as considering banning a political party or approving military courts. But correct me if I'm wrong, there are parties in this current ruling dispensation, in this current government, that have themselves had bad experiences with the military in the past, haven't they? Yes. So I'll give you an example of Benazir Bhutto. Um, 
She has been Pakistan's Prime Minister twice. She was assassinated in 2007, but she's mother of Pakistan's current Foreign Minister, uh, uh, Bilawal Bhutto. And uh, during her uh, political career, she had fallout with military multiple times. So she was twice deposed as PM, and it's widely considered that it happened uh, because um, uh, the military played a role in her ouster. Um, and her father, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, who was Prime Minister in 1970s, um, he was deposed as PM and then hanged by a military dictator, General Zia. And not only the Bhutto uh, party, but if you look at Sharif party, so Nawaz Sharif, who has been Pakistan's prime minister thrice, he also had a fallout with military throughout his career. And once one of his government was overthrown in a military coup um, in 1999, and then General Pervez Musharraf took over. Uh, so politicians know that if they, uh, if they want to remain in power, um, it's very difficult to oppose uh, men in uniform. And Nawaz Sharif, the brother of the current serving Prime yes. Minister Shabazz Sharif. I mean, this is just... It, it, all of this is a part of Pakistan's history, and I therefore wonder if there is a way to break out of this cycle of military control. It is a very difficult question. There is no easy solution. But if you speak to analysts in Pakistan or international commentators, they say that if politicians can come together, if they can talk out their differences, and if there's a political consensus um, that democracy has to be protected in Pakistan, there could be a solution to the current crisis. And also, um, they also believe that Pakistan should have free and fair elections according to the constitution, which means in October, uh, Pakistan should have elections. Um, but so far, the situation looks, uh, the, is the, the political crisis makes the situation very unpredictable. Pinish, we'll have to leave it there for the time being, but thanks so much for coming into the studio and breaking that down for us.